You know, this is a great community, isn't it? Um, a lot of what we've just heard about, for me, is about giants. These are giant things, aren't they? Some things we just see is in the, the mole hills, and we can get over them or trip up or mention them to you, but a cancer like that, a brother having double surgery and waiting for those results, they're giants. And I suspect, again, that every one of us here has giants that we're having to face in life. And they could be the giant of, of debt and how we're going to pay the bills. It can be the giant, of, giant of, of sickness or pain. It can be the giant of a boss who's a, just so difficult at work or a colleague. It can be the giant of testing, It can be the giant of grieving uh, the loss of family losses, which some of us have gone through recently. The, the, the number of giants are without number, but what we face is, is real. And um, might not seem so big to somebody else. That's often the way, isn't it? That's it? Oh, I, I eat those for breakfast for some people. But for you, it's a major thing. This morning, we're looking at giants. We're looking at giant slaying, actually looking at that famous story of David and Goliath. It's well known, and yet I suspect for most of us, we never really look beneath the surface of what it's about. So I hope as I'm going to teach on this, that it'll be helpful to you, Tak, and your family, and Shanaz, and everyone else of us who are facing giants. We're going to have a reading uh, from 1 Samuel 17. I hope you all managed to get one of these on the way in. You'll see it's quite a long reading. Believe you me, chapter 17 is a very long chapter. So I've taken excerpts from it to try and make it sense. Otherwise, we would be reading this until lunchtime. Um, so if you haven't got one of these, raise a hand. We'll give you copies of them. Remember, we're reproducers, not receivers. So that means we're not just going to hear this, this word and then say, what's for me? And if it's not relevant for me, we're just going to ditch it. We're going to reproduce it. So we're going to see what's for me and apply it. And then we're going to take notes like crazy so we can teach this on to other people in our own families, our neighborhoods. So I'm delighted. I, I grinned last week when I saw some people taking notes. Yes, that's going to happen now. We're taking it seriously. All right. Father God, as we read your word, we pray that it would speak to us. A word that is um, breathed by your Holy Spirit. A word in this case been around for uh, 3,000 plus years and yet still relevant today. Please come and meet with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join with me. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley of Elah between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. And so the Israelite army saw him. They began to run away in fright. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, Who is this pagan Philistine anyway, that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. I've done this to both lions and bears. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he'd never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. 
Goliath walked out toward David with his shield-bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell down on the ground. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. Great story, isn't it? Even if we grew up with that one, it's still a cracker. Um, and what it's about is a stronghold of fear. It's about fear. Fear paralyzes us. The old phrase, give fear an inch and it will take a mile, probably applies to other things as well. But that's what fear does. It literally makes us stop in our tracks. It turns our, our legs to jelly. It, it pro prohibits us from thinking clearly and acting. We are fearful. It's a close cousin of worry. Fear and worry go hand in glove, although I think fear is more tangible often in the sense that you can often see the fear. You know why you're responding in fear, what's going on. The link with worry is that neither of them are a disease that you can be healed from. Neither of those two things are you born with. You're not born a worrier, nor are you born timid and fearful. And that's good news, as we'll discover later on. Although some people seem to hide behind that as an excuse. No, fear comes into us through the, the devil working into our lives. He forms a stronghold within us. He takes control of that part of our life. And he will make us bow down in fear. Fear of people. Fear of man is a, a very common excuse for people making poor decisions. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what might happen, that's the same, as I said, to worry, just they're the same words in one sense, fear. And not only is the church riddled with fear, actually, but our society is as well. We're so fearful about things that we refuse to look into the future and, and, and make plans. We, we want to live in the now. We don't want to actually face up to those things. Um, some of you were, uh, came to one of the services that I ran and, and spoke at for my father-in-law's funeral last month. And uh, there was some negative response to the, 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 the talks that I gave. Uh, I gave them uh, with the request of, of my father-in-law's children, saying, please just preach the gospel. We know where the father-in-law is, we know where he's gone, and we'd like everyone else to be there too. And some of the negative response that I received was, that was not an appropriate time to talk about that. And I'm thinking, well, when is an appropriate time to talk about death? And so I, I actually, one person, I just said it straight up. Why don't you want to talk about death? It's inevitable. One out of one die, with the exception of Enoch. I mean, you've really got that on maybe Elijah. Um, you know, really, the odds are you're going to sort of die, uh, unless the Lord returns before that, in which case you're in trouble because you're not a believer. Um, so why don't you want to face the inevitable? Why are you fearful of facing it? And, and they didn't get, give me a response. They alluded to a couple of things. But truthfully, it was, I, I just don't want to have to deal with that. Because the moment I, I, I pick that rock up and see what's underneath, and see what's crawling around in that one, then I'm going to have to actually make some decisions. I'm going to have to maybe change my life and lifestyle. I have to face up to the fact that I am mortal and this life will end. And I prefer not to. I want to keep the rock solidly down. So I can just put fingers in my ears, going, da, 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 da. I'm going to die, but I'm just going to live for the now. 
Of course, when we're younger, I speak now as a man who's not so young, although I feel that way. When we're younger, we feel we're immortal, don't we? We don't, we don't think that we are going to die. We do the most crazy things, which is probably a good thing we don't think well, because we never do those crazy things. Uh, we go out on the adventures, and then we're all shocked when someone who is our age dies. It doesn't matter how old you are, by the way. When someone your age dies, you go, like, they were my age. Oh, my goodness. People do that? People die at my age? Whatever age it is, it always shocks you. I mean, the other things that shock you is when the President of the United States is younger than you. That shocks you, doesn't it? You know, and, and things like that, but, and policemen and all that sort of stuff. But, but this is the, the, the fear. So fear is rooted in us, and it manifests in many different ways. I like to like in the sense of prefer rather than like as in this is something I enjoy. I do like to think of fears as giants. They seem so big. They seem so immovable. They seem so dominating. That's what giants do. And yet we have a story here of a giant slayer, someone who conquers fear. Now, there is a healthy fear. Let's just get that out there straight away. It's, God's given us that flight or flee or fire or whatever it is thing so that you know, if you happen to be hanging around a wild animal that's about to sort of munch you for lunch, the healthy fear says get out of there. Um, and that's good. You know, if there's a fire raging, the healthy fear is don't go too close to it. Um, th th that's good stuff to have that, and that's wise to have that. There's a healthy fear of God. It's good to remember that. We're told frequently throughout Scripture to fear God. That doesn't mean that we have this cowering fear of God, at least not if you're a follower of His. It's a respect and a reverence. And so you see a couple of references up there. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to have God's wisdom and God's knowledge. And frankly, that's the only stuff that matters. The rest of it isn't really very clever. Then you have to respect him. You have to come into his presence to receive that. There's the fear, which is good. Uh, you'll see I put up there... Uh, Psalm 33, verse 18, and a couple of verses from Psalm 103. The correct respect of God leads to us receiving love from God. When we approach Him, not in a, an arrogant manner, but come in a humble way towards Him as Father, and then He pours out love into our hearts. It's one of the dangers that uh, some aspects, some parts of the church have got into. They've got over-familiar with God. I mean, there's always those two tensions. The tension that has God... Um, too distant, too almighty, too holy, that we can't approach him. And so we never do. That's never the intention. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're supposed to be close to him. But there's the other extreme that has God as our, our, our best mate, who we hang out with, and we're, we're pretty cool. You know, him and I, were like this. And that takes away the awesome holiness of God. And so as usual, we find ourselves in this tension place in the middle where we never want to let go of God's holiness, but we never want to let go of the fact that he's our father. And we stand in the middle and we resist the challenge to sway one way or the other. And when we get that right, we find a father who loves us and pours that love into our hearts. And you'll see there's also, I put up there Deuteronomy 10 verse 12, it leads to us loving God. We love because he first loved us. That's what we're told. That's the order. But when we receive his love, we love him back. And that's the, the love is the currency of the kingdom of God. That's the currency of the kingdom. And it comes because we get the right attitude, the right respect towards God. So there's good stuff here. But there is also unhelpful stuff. Just to say, by the way, God's kingdom is run by faith. That's where we're going to be going in this talk. So just have that phrase in your mind. Faith and fear are opposites. So there's this wrong, unhealthy fear, which is not based on the currency of love. It's based on lies, because that's the way the enemy works. I think what uh, 1 John 4 is very interesting, verse 18. There's no fear in love, period. That's just a statement. But perfect love drives out fear. I want you to see there's a, a real powerful action taking place. Perfect love drives this stuff out. Because fear has to do with punishment. 
You see, we understand that when we come to the Father now, because of Jesus Christ, we're not coming fearful of his punishment. Jesus has already taken the punishment in full on the cross. So we can come into his presence, not think, thinking that he's left a little bit of punishment over for you and for me, just to keep us in order. No, Jesus paid the price in full. So we fear no punishment from the Father if we're in Christ. Fears to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So if you come and approach the Father in fear, it's because you do, in the wrong fear, it's because you don't know that you've been forgiven. You haven't understood that. Now the devil works on lies. His kingdom is based on lies, and he really likes fear. Because fear drives us away from love. And God is love. That's where John goes in John 4, 1 John 4. God is love. So fear is going to make us act in the opposite spirit. It's going to drive us away from the love of God. It really is going back to what we heard this morning when we looked at our confession time. It's not trusting in his faithfulness, not believing his promises, seeing the giants and actually saying, I don't know whether you can do this, God. I don't know whether you really can help me get rid of this debt. I don't know whether you can heal. I don't know whether you can help me in this workplace. I don't know whether you can get me a job again. I don't know whether I will ever be re reconciled with my parents or my prodigal children or whatever it might be. Fear lets the mountain get high and our faith diminish. And so Satan's kingdom is run on fear. So we have the, God's kingdom run by faith, Satan's kingdom run by fear, and there's a battle between the two. Frankly, that's what the battle is. Are you going to live by faith or live by fear? And you realize that it's a choice of one or the other. There's your two options. It's not, I'll take the third option, which is partially faith and partially fear. You're going to choose one or the other of those options. And they, so therefore, the response to this will actually determine the outcome of your life. Your life will be a, a faith-filled outcome or a fear-filled life. And I know for so long that I lived fearful, fearful, and it exploded in my life, and I use that word dramatically but truthfully, in people-pleasing. And most of my friends saw that, the ones who loved me saw that and told me, but I would justify it in all sorts of ways. But really it was fear. It was fear of what other people might do, which would be negative to me or negative whatever I was doing, fear of not getting their approval, fear of, of, of letting them down, a fear of goodness knows whatever. I'm still sure there's remnants of that in me. I don't want to pretend that I'm mighty and victorious in every way, but I've learned to have the fear of God and to walk in faith is more important than to let the fear of man and walk in fear. So I'm just once again telling you where I'm at. Now I did tell you that because fear and worry are not a disease that, that can be cured or something you're born with is good news because actually they're sin. Fear and worry are sins. And that is fantastic news. That's the best news you'll hear today because Jesus died for sins. Jesus paid the penalty in full on the cross for our sins. See, if it was just the way you are, that's who you are. Nothing we can do about that. But if it's sin, then there's forgiveness and there's change. So really grasp hold of this and say, praise God. I wasn't created a warrior. I was created to be a warrior, actually. I wasn't created to be timid. I was created to be courageous. And I can be forgiven for where I have not trusted God and not walked in faith. The cross is magnificent, my friends. It really helps us. Unbelief, though, must be driven out by faith. I think I said yesterday, the church is riddled with unbelief. It really is. We're going to be the people who stand on the promises of God. Now, as usual, and unsurprisingly, our example is Jesus. He lived the fully human life, He's, because he was fully human as well as being fully God. He was tempted just as we are. He went into situations that were worse than we will face, and he didn't give in in any way, particularly to fear. Why not? Because Satan never had any, remember that word topos we looked at yesterday, any entry point into his life, any jurisdiction in his life. The time when I think he got the closest he ever got to in fear must have been in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he was betrayed. 
I mean, that guy is sweating blood. And that's a medical condition. I was reading about it recently. That if you do that, you are in, under incredible pressure, tension. Now, wh why was that? He's facing the cross. He's facing the crucifixion. And he's before his dad, and he's saying, Dad, I don't really want to do this. Is there another way? And dad is saying effectively, you know, son, we, we talked about this from eternity past. We know there is another way. Because do you think if there was another way that the wisest God of all wouldn't have taken the alternate? This is the only way to deal with mankind's sin so that we can have reconciliation. The only option available to us. But why was Jesus sweating blood? Because truthfully, and, I, and please, this isn't me wanting to do this, crucifixion was commonplace in those days. Many, many were crucified. And so often I think we've overstated the crucifixion, the actual horror of that, and it is a horrifying thing, and saying, well, that's why he was sweating. That's why he was so terrified. I don't think he in any way enjoyed it, but that wasn't the reason he was sweating blood. The physical side was awful, but that's not what was causing him to cry out to the Father and say, you know, is there another way? Sometimes I think the emotional side was greater than the physical. The betrayal of one of his closest friends, the denial of another, and the running away of all those people. Because at the end of the day, isn't that what really hurts in our life when, when people let us down, when people stab us in the back, when people do that to us? That hurts, doesn't it? That really hurts. Um, physical pain, I mean, some of you know I slipped a disc on Friday morning, and um, I'm in pain. Make no bones about it. I'm in a lot of pain at the moment. Um, but I tell myself, and it's true, it's a mechanical pain. There's a disc and a nerve. It causes me pain. That's life. I was saying to someone yesterday, you know, being unemployed, that's, that's horrible. That's worse than what I've got. That sort of stuff. But when, when there's a betrayal, that hurts. But you know, bad as that is, that wasn't why he was sweating blood. You know what he said to his dad? He said, Father, take this cup away from me. It's very specific. And throughout the scripture, the cup means one thing. It means God's judgment, God's wrath, God's anger. That's what the cup means. What he is sweating bullets over is the fact that he knows on that cross, he is going to take the full wrath and anger of a holy God on himself undeserved because he lived the life that we should live. He lived the perfect life. And now he's dying the death we should have died. He's dying in our place. And he takes the wrath of God for every sinful act and thought and deed and the stuff we didn't do when we should have done of every human being who has ever lived or ever will live on himself at that time. The full wrath and anger of God was poured out on Jesus that's why he's saying, take this away from me. He is staring into the abyss. And he knows that the moment that takes place, he will be forsaken by the Father and the Spirit. He knows that that relationship, which has been eternal, will be broken. That for the first time in eternity, he will not know the love of the Father and the love of the Spirit and their presence. And the agony on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is the moment when he became sin and forsaken. And I just so, I mean, I, I mean, two things occur to me at this point. One is, there is Jesus who had it so much worse than we will ever conceive of, who still did not give in to fear. Still went, they said, but not my will, but yours. I will be faithful because you are the loving Father, and I will trust you in this, and I will go through it. And resurrection does come, by the way. So I see that, and I, and I marvel at it. I marvel that he took my place, that I did not have to go through that because I have my faith in Jesus. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, then you stand under that judgment. I marvel that he didn't walk away, as he could have done, because he'd never done anything wrong. He was not guilty. I marvel at so many different levels at the greatness of God, because he moved in faith and not in fear. 
This is what we're talking about. That's giant slaying. That's a giant that Jesus drove out in the perfect love. I've given you a, a different one. It's a much smaller occurrence that happened in his life. When Jesus in Luke 13 were told, is said, it's told that Herod is after you, mate. Herod's trying to kill you. And Jesus drives it out. He turns around. It's just almost a throwaway comment. Tell that fox. <laughs> and then he continues doing it. This is Herod, the king of the area. And this is Jesus saying, oh, you can tell that guy. <laughs> Shut off. I'm going this way. You're not going to get anything on me, Mr. Herod. The big one is the cup of wrath which he passed the test and drove out fear. In my experience, fear is rarely, sometimes, but rarely a natural experience. And by that I mean that moment if you've been there with a kid is just about to run out into the street, you get that <laughs> fear. It just shoots through your body. It's an adrenaline rush and you are fearful. For my family on Thursday, that fear lasted a bit longer with Kezia having that anaphylactic reaction. Um, but once that EpiPen had worked, and by the way, I've said this before, if anyone knows who invented the EpiPen, please tell me. I want to send them a Christmas card. Um, that's three times that my, my daughter's life's been saved through, through the EpiPen. Um, that was that longer term, but it, it, it dissipates. Fear, most of the time, we can see it in Scripture, we can see it in our own life, is a spiritual thing. There's a spirit of fear. And therefore, it needs to be combated supernaturally. We've got to come against this in the spiritual realm. And here are some verses. Uh, first, on a positive note, Romans 8, 15. The Spirit, and you see the capital S there, means the Holy Spirit, God himself, you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. So spiritual battle, the Holy Spirit frees us. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought you about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. So there is a spirit of, a spirit of fear and timidity, but it didn't come from God. It comes from the other guy. That's the basis of his uh, kingdom. He's given us a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. And we can see Jesus walking that, uh, w working out that way. There's a story of, of Jairus, who's the synagogue ruler, and comes to Jesus and says, would you come to my home? My 12-year-old daughter is just about to die. And Jesus says, yes, I'll come. Mid-route, Jesus is waylaid by a woman who needs some healing, and he heals her. And at that point, messengers come to Jairus who say, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's died. And now it's, it's just like fear and calamity. Jesus turns around and says, don't be afraid. Just have what? Faith. And he drives out the fear from Jairus. He says, man, you came and got me. Now you stick believing. You did the right thing. You went and got me. Now it looks like the giants are winning or won. It looks like they're laid against you. But you got me. Just lesson number one. Get Jesus. And now stay with him. Be faithful. And you know the story. He goes there and he prays or does whatever he does. Holds the little girl's hand and she comes back to life. Have faith. So let's focus on this chapter. You thought we'd never get to 1 Samuel 17, didn't we? So did I. But anyway, let's focus on this chapter. And I want us to look at the three characters here. It should have only been two, but it becomes three. There's a lot of fear in this chapter. It's a chapter about giants. It's a chapter about fear. There's King Saul. There's the bully, Goliath. And there's the shepherd boy, David. And it's about fear or faith. Behind it all is about whom do you worship? So much of the scriptures about worship, by the way. Who do you worship? Are you going to worship the gods that Goliath worships? It looks like they're stronger at the moment, doesn't it? He's dominating, and the God of Israel doesn't seem to be doing much. His followers are just quaking in their boots. And on that sort of physical level, it looks like, my goodness, the gods of the Philistines are stronger than the God of Israel. Who is the victor here? That's the question. And that day, if the Philistines had won that battle, the assumption would be that the God of Israel is not as strong as the gods of the Philistines. It would have been a wrong assumption, but that's how it had been seen. This is a demonic battle taking place in the spiritual realms. That's what's going on. So let's look at um, Saul to start with, because actually David should never have been in this picture at all if Saul had been doing what he's supposed to do. 
Saul was the first king of Israel. And it's very clear the king's job is twofold, to provide and to protect the people. That's your job. He has as his co-leader a man called Samuel, who is the prophet. He's the guy who does, in one sense, the sacrifices, the, the more religious side. And together, they're supposed to work as a team. That gets united in Jesus. He's both king and prophet. But they're supposed to work in tandem together. And Saul blows it. And the main reason he blows it is because he's a man of fear. He is like I was, like I am to some degree, a people pleaser. That was one of his biggest problems. He actually liked being king more than he liked obeying God. So he didn't have his faith in God. He put his faith in the position that he'd been given, which he now had. And so when there became a problem, and what happened was the Philistine army began to invade Israel as the king, his job was to provide and protect. And God had said, if you do that and you trust me, you will drive out the enemies. And you will have provision for your country. The man who came after him, David, got it right. Made some mistakes, he got it right. And the Philistines were driven out. But because Saul liked being king so much, he did everything he could to, to please people so he could stay king, keep their support. And he stepped out of the boundaries that God had given to him. It gets to the point where he actually makes sacrifices, the job that Samuel had, to try and keep people happy. He went out of his boundaries. He covers his fear with religion. That's often what we do, by the way. We cover up our sin and our, our fear by doing something religious. We think it's going to somehow work. It doesn't. You haven't driven out the fear. You're not walking by faith, you just resorted to some mumbo jumbo. And you can call it whatever you like. Modern day, we do different things. But that's what you're doing. You're trusting in some pagan, because it's become pagan at that right. Even God says, you know, am I impressed by your sacrifices and offerings? No, I'm not. They don't mean a thing to me. I know you're doing exactly as I described in the book, but your heart isn't there. As Jesus said later on, I, I used it in my prayer email last week, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And I look at the heart. And God does what he always does when we put an idol between ourselves and him. He removes the idol. So God says to Saul, then, then this has got too big. It's come between me and you, so I'm removing the kingship from you. That's a warning, guys. You put something or somebody between yourself and God, some activity, some desire, some aim, something between you and God, he will remove that because he loves you too much for you to have and worship something else. And, of course, he's not repentant in his disobedience. So there's Saul. His identity is in his position and, actually, strange enough, in his height. When he's elected as the king, they all marvel at how tall he is. He's head and shoulders above everyone else. He is the giant of his land. It's absolutely brilliant if you have that until two things occur. Okay? First, if you leave God and God leaves you, now your position as king is, is not tenable. And second, if you come across a Goliath who is massive, who looks down at you and you just come up to his waist. And then it doesn't matter whether you're head and shoulders above everybody else. You are a midget compared to this dude. And now the two things that you put your identity in and your reliance upon are not worth anything. And then the real fear comes out. You see, the thing for Saul is the king, the leader, is the gateway for the rest of the people. That's the way it works in kingdom stuff. So you're either going to let good stuff in or bad stuff in. Jesus said, I am the gate. He calls himself the gate. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you're a leader in his kingdom, then, then you are the gatekeeper under him. So look what happens here. When Saul and the Israelites, this is 1 Samuel 17, verse 11, heard this, that's Goliath's challenge, they were terrified and deeply shaken. But do you see who's first? Saul heard it and was terrified, and now everyone else is terrified too. It, it spreads. God expected faith from him and not fear. Now the thing, of course, is Saul knew that. Saul knew that he should be the one standing up against Goliath. 
Saul knew that. And so did the, all, all the army. Everybody knew that Saul was fearful and a coward. It wasn't a secret. The fact is, though, none of the other people wanted to go forward either. But you're looking around and you're saying, well, Saul, you're the king, and you're bigger than anyone else, so take him on. And Saul's like, yeah, the diary's quite full at the moment. I think I'll do something else. And so he backs away, and fear takes over. Giants do that, don't they? That's what they do. And that's what Saul does. I, you know, truthfully, if I'm in his shoes, I'm not even around the valley by this point. I've gone off somewhere else, you know. So he's there. Let's look at this bully, this dominant person, Goliath. He's a, a man who intimidates. You notice that every day he's out there taunting them. Every day. Now imagine you hear this every day. Imagine you're Saul hearing this every day, but imagine you're one of the Israelite army. Every time he does that, you just cower one more time. You just lose more of your spirit, more of your fight. You're made to feel that much smaller. Do you have that in your life? Every time you're with this person, they just can't resist pulling you down another peg. They can't resist that insinuation. They can't resist that comment. And every time you hear it, it's just another blow, isn't it? That's what some people can do. Now, you know, that's the enemy working through them. But that's what happens. Fear is Satan's weapon to disable the Israelites. And they are terrified. They are paralyzed to a man. The fact of the matter is, no matter how tall Goliath was, if they'd all rushed him at once, they would have defeated him. A few guys would have gone down, but they would have taken him out. Fear paralyzes it. Fear paralyzes the church. Well, what if we did do that? Well, it might go wrong. What if we did that? Well, it might not work. What if we did? And we paralyze because we're frightened of what might happen. Well, they might not think that. that, might, that, that. We're so good at this. It needs to be unmasked, dismantled, destroyed. We've got to take action against it. Now, here's the thing for Goliath. He thought that he was his own master. I'm absolutely certain he wasn't the captain of the Philistine army. I don't think he was the sharpest knife in the drawer. I think he probably had a brain like a two-watt bulb between you and me. But he was big. And if you're the army captain, you send that dude at the front. But you're not daft. You're not putting the rest of him in, in, in his charge. Good heavens, I don't think he could run a bath. I mean, seriously. But he's out there. Unbeknown to Goliath, though, because I don't think he'd figured that out, he is a slave of Satan. That's all he is. Remember, if you're not in God's kingdom, you're in the other dude's kingdom. He's a slave of Satan. And notice how he's cursing David by what? The names of his gods. They're demons, by the way. That's what he's cursing them by. All right? He's expressing scorn for God. He's dismissing that. He is a lackey of Satan who will chew him up and spit him out because that's what Satan does. Steal, kill, and destroy. So there's this great, dominant, fearful monster who is actually nothing more than a mouthpiece of Satan. So it's sad, really, isn't it? So let's come to David, the shepherd boy. The background story, which we didn't read, is that Dad has said to David, uh, will you go out and um, go to the army? Will you take some cheese and some bread to, for your brothers and for the commanding officer because they're on the front lines? So David sort of Moses up, and he does his job, and then he hears Goliath making these curses and challenging and taunting. And he turns around and says, who's that dude? That's an uncircumcised Philistine taking out the name of God. And the first thing his brother says, oh, be quiet, David. You don't know what you're talking about. What are you doing here anyway? Shove off. They didn't want to be reminded. That's a classic response to people who feel absolutely guilty at the fact that David is saying what they should be saying. Do you do that? I do that with my children when they point out my mistakes. I, I sort of come back with a counterattack, hoping that I can sort of fool them with a long sentence. And, and, and then, oh, look, there's a bird. Did you look? You didn't look. I mean, don't you do that? You get angry with them. You get dismissive of them. You belittle them. Anything rather than actually have to confess and admit that, yeah, you know. So that's what's happened. And later on, he gets scorned by Goliath. The crazy thing is he doesn't have any fear. He is the only person who doesn't have any fear. And he's never been to the Valley of Elah. He's never been before Goliath. He's never been the battle. What the heck does he know? Maybe it's the, you know, ignorance that, that helps him out. Who knows? I think it's because actually he knew who he was. He was a man of faith. He faced the same facts as everybody else, 
But the difference is that he's confident in God. Why? Because as a shepherd boy, he hadn't just idled his life away thinking of nothing. He spent his time thinking about God, writing songs to God, being with God. And so he knew his God. And he hadn't just had it easy. He'd fought lion and bear. Now, you just glance over that. I mean, do you like we just read that bit and move on? Lion and bear. I, I, I've never really been that close to bear in the wild. I've seen one on the other side of the road. But I've been very close to lion when I lived in Africa, all right? Very close. And even though I was safe inside a vehicle, I'm scared. Okay? Those things kill for fun. And I am, frankly, lunch. Okay? That is scary. They don't have morals. I'm not sure Goliath had many either. They don't have ethics. They just want to get you, kill you, and eat you. And he's fought them on his own. I mean, seriously, don't glance over that verse. He's sitting there going like, I fought those. God was with me. I've got the experience. I know how to deal with this. I look at Goliath and I go like, yeah, he's a bit bigger than a bear, but he doesn't have the skills of a bear. He doesn't have the claws of a bear. He doesn't have the mouth of a bear. And he's a bit bigger than a, 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 a lion, but not the speed of a lion. doesn't have anything like that. Nah, nah, not really up to a bear or a lion. Don't think much of him. I mean, he just dismisses this guy. As far as he is concerned, Goliath doesn't rank. He's seeing from a completely different experience, isn't he? He had a spirit of faith, not of fear. The great definition of faith, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The late John Wimber used to spell faith. He used to say, faith is a four-letter word spelled S-U-R-E, sure. He was sure of God's presence and sure of the experience that he'd had and therefore confident in where he went. Not arrogant, but confident. So when we engage with fear, what we're doing is we're actually calling God a liar. I don't believe your word. I don't believe your promises. I don't believe you're true. And we cover that up because we're clever enough to do that, but that's truthfully what's going on. When we engage with faith, we trust God and we move in the Spirit. So as far as David was concerned, Goliath was simply a dead man walking. It's just a question of when you're going to fall over, pal. Now, are we able to look at the giants in our life with faith? Are we able to do that? It may or may not turn out as happily as Goliath falling over and dying. We might have to go through this. We might have to live with some things. I'm not going to say that everything has a happy ending. Jesus died on that cross. But there was a resurrection. Where are we going with this? Now, it's important that we look at this. Saul's armor. Do you notice that part when, when um, Saul decides that he ought to do something? This is Saul. He's absolutely relieved that David stands up and says, I'll do it. At long last, there's some sucker willing to go out there. Okay? But now he feels he ought to be something, do something. And it's, it's a good intention. It really is. He, Saul owns the best armor in the army. He really is. The best armor. It's the most secure armor. It's got the most solid metal or whatever it is. So he's, he's offering the best. But if you recall, Saul is head and shoulders in height above everybody else. And David is a ruddy-faced boy, quote Goliath. So you can imagine lumping that armor on David. He's just going to waddle his way forward. It's not going to work. It's not helpful. It doesn't fit. That is the difference between a good idea and a God idea. And good ideas are bound by the gazillion, but if they're not God ideas, they lead to defeat. And we need to be able to differentiate between the two. So Saul's armor represents every good idea, every piece of advice and wisdom that people pass on to you. But note the catch, Saul's armor didn't do Saul any good. He had that armor himself, but he ain't going to go and face Goliath. Isn't it amazing how people have something which didn't work for them, but they're happy to tell you to use it? Go figure. Uh, you know, it's a, what? Those are good ideas. You cannot leave where you haven't gone. You can't do it. So we've got to be able to, as a church, differentiate between the good ideas and the God ideas. There are plenty of good ideas. There are plenty of wonderful intentions that we can all have to do what we should be doing. But are they from God? Because if they're not, we'll be unable to move. 
would have taken somebody's good idea and dressed ourselves in it and we'll be doing this. And we say, but it's a good idea. It must be from God, but we're not really doing very much and we're stuck. And that's hard to do. It was really hard for David to say no to Goliath with that armor. Please understand that. To say no to the king who is already feeling foolish that this boy is willing to go in his place. To reject the one thing that he felt that he could offer, this really best intentioned idea. That's really hard to say no. Don't, don't misunderstand that. He had to be modest, but also sure of where he stood. To stick with what he knew, his training. He knew that to wear that armor would be disaster. Borrowed armor is always a disaster. As a church and as individuals. It's always a disaster. It's not made for you. It's made for somebody else. David's faithful actions. Coming to the close of this talk, just in case you're wondering. David's faithful actions. First of all, he knelt at the stream. I know it didn't say that in the scriptures he knelt there, but I don't think you can pick up five smooth stones if you're bending over. Certainly if you have a back like mine. So you're either kneeling or you're squatting down. And it's an incredible contrast. You've got Goliath on one side and the, the Philistines. You've got the fearful army on the other and Saul. And you've got David right in the middle. And he's kneeling down. He's not paying any attention. It's like, in one sense, he's just centering his thoughts on God. He's taking a peaceful moment. He's, he's saying, it's your battle, God. The battle belongs to the Lord. He's focused that way. And so where you've got Saul, and all Saul can see is this huge man and this large army that he should have gone against. All David can see is God and a giant who's uncircumcised and defiant against a God. And that's perspective, isn't it? That's what's going on. So the first thing was he, he was unafraid. The second is that then he ran fearlessly and boldly. When God said move, he went. He don't dither when God says go. And I suspect like Goliath, like most bullies, had never had someone run towards him. They used to be running away from them. So I think he's discombobulated. So I said, not sure the neurons are really firing. So now he's got David coming towards him and he's like, what the hang? You're supposed to run away, everybody does. And David declares his faith and his trust in God. He says, that's where the glory's going. And he takes out his stone and he slings it out and Goliath goes down. And what happens then? What happens immediately then? The fearful Israelites suddenly become faithful. And they storm into battle. And the arrogant Philistines suddenly become fearful and they get defeated. You see, one person's faith changes everything. One person's faith turns the whole thing around. One person who dares to stand up to the giant can change it around. The, qu the question is, who is that person? And in your life, in many occasions, it will be you. It will be you to stand up. You to face down that giant. You to have the courage to do that. The final question I want to ask is, why did David choose five smooth stones? I know this one. Oh, so proud. <laughs> Some people think it's... No, um, <laughs> the fact is, David was confident. I don't think he, David thought for one moment he was going to miss. That wasn't that going to reload time. My personal belief, as I've said, Goliath was going to be dead anyway. If De David had put the stone in the sling, slung it around, and then the stone had fallen out, I think that stone would have supernaturally just bounced up and taken that Goliath anyway. Now, the fact is, as we read elsewhere, that Goliath had four other relatives who were also huge, brothers and sons. And personally, I think David took five stones and said, bring it on. There's five of you. Come on. All of you. I'm taking them all on. All together, one at a time. Doesn't matter. My God's bigger. It doesn't matter how many giants you throw against me. My God's bigger. And very rarely, by the way, in life do we ever get just one giant facing us. They tend to come together. But it's interesting, when the first one went down, the others never appeared. Those giants fled. David took them out because he had faith in God. Full of faith. Fear is rooted in deceit and lies. Faith is rooted in the truth and the promises of a reliable, loving father. That's the way it is. And faith is more powerful than fear. Hallelujah. 
So when we're full of faith and full of the Spirit, we can see God at work driving out fear. So what I want us to do to close with is I want to take you through a prayer to demolish the stronghold of fear. Now, if you were here over the weekend, I said very clearly, this is a model prayer. It's not going to do it instantaneously. You need to work this stuff through. But it'll give you an idea of how the, the, the work of the Spirit um, moves in us to demolish strongholds. It's based on the five R's, which uh, if you weren't here, I'm going to quickly tell you. The first R is to recognize Recognize that you've been living in sin. Recognize that you've been fearful, worrying. It's a sin. Don't cover it up. Recognize it. Acknowledge it. Confess it. Say you're sorry. Ask the Father to forgive you. It also means that you need to recognize the giants around you. Name what they are. And if it's been people who are bullying you, name them and forgive them. Really hard. Really hard. But that's the first step. The second R is to receive the Father's forgiveness. Because the enemy will always undermine that and say, well, you weren't really forgiven. You didn't deserve that. No, Jesus died on the cross, paid for it in full, so you receive the Father's forgiveness. The third R is to repent, to think differently by the help of the Spirit. So you're no longer going to walk in fear. You're going to walk in faith. In the opposite spirit, you're going to believe the promises of God in your life. The fourth R then is to rebuke the enemy, rebuke Satan. Stand against him and say, right, you've had, you've had your time. Now your number's up. You've been identified. God's at work. Get out. And the fifth R is to replace into your life God's strongholds, God's stuff, faith, truth, love, so that we stand on that, which is what David was standing on when he took on Goliath. Amen? So let's stand. And join with me if you would. There is going to be a moment during this prayer where we're going to pause to actually in our hearts name some of those things. All right? Please join with me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have allowed fear to have a hold in my life. And as a result, I have acted in ways that have not brought you glory. I've been more concerned about pleasing others or worried about their responses. I've compromised your standards and ignored my conscience rather than confront my fears and face the consequences of doing so. And I'll name the specific fears I've allowed to dominate my life and the people whom Satan has used to do this. I'm going to pause briefly just for a few seconds as we do that. Let's continue. I ask for your forgiveness for not trusting you for my every need, and I choose to forgive those who have bullied and threatened me and use fear to manipulate my life. Father, because Jesus allowed his blood to be shed on the cross on my behalf, I receive your forgiveness for not trusting you and for all my subsequent actions which I took because I allowed fear a central place in my life. And I ask that you would forgive and have mercy on those who have oppressed me. Father, I repent of the ways I have lived in agreement with the lies of fear with which Satan has powerfully bound me. In the power of the Spirit, I choose to walk in the opposite spirit, one of faith and love of you and your ways of truth and life. Satan, I have confessed named and exposed the lies upon which you have built within me a stronghold of fear. I've received the Father's total forgiveness, and I've freely forgiven those whom you have used to hurt me. I have repented, and I choose to walk in God's truth and in His love. Your stronghold has been demolished, and your jurisdiction in my life is now terminated. I therefore rebuke you with the authority of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Get out of my life now and never return. Father, I ask the Holy Spirit to pour out the love of God into my life. A love so powerful that it will drive out all fears and the memories of them. I ask for a spirit of power, 
boldness and self-control with which I can stand firm against the enemy. And I pray that from now on, I would choose to live by faith in the truths of the Bible. I ask these things for your glory and for the fame of your Son, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.